All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of our evolution seminar series. So today we'll be taking a dive into reptilian genomics as we are joined by Tony Gamble, an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Marquette University. So without further ado, let's get into the science. Please join me in welcoming Tony Gamble. All right. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Oh, hi, Brett. <laughs> Um, everybody can hear me okay? All right, perfect. Um, so uh, this is just a brief outline of what I'm going to discuss today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on sex chromosomes, um, why they're interesting, how, what are they, that sort of thing. I'm going to discuss a couple challenges that folks have encountered in studying sex chromosomes, um, and and actually how we, and I by we, I mean like myself, as well as collaborators, but also kind of the broader sex chromosome community, solve these challenges. The first is figuring out whether a species has XX, XY sex chromosomes versus the ZZ, ZW systems. Uh, and then the other one is figuring out which chromosomes in the genome are the sex chromosomes. So spoiler alert, we figured that out, but I'm going to show you kind of how we did that. Uh, and then I'm going to give you kind of two examples once we figured out how to do this of um, identifying sex chromosomes and kind of weird critters. So the first example is sex chromosome evolution in Puerto Rican leaf litter geckos. And the second one is kind of a reevaluation of sex chromosomes in snakes. So most animal species reproduce sexually and require some uh, sex determining mechanism to allocate some individuals as males and others as females. And sex determination and the subsequent sexual differentiation results in individuals that differ not just in their, in their gametes and gonads, but in all aspects of morphology, uh, behavior, and physiology. Um, but despite its near universality, the mechanisms that different species use to control sex termination can be quite variable. And very broadly, we can lump these into uh, environmental sex determination, where some environmental factor during embryogenesis determines sex, in uh, vertebrates uh, and reptiles in particular, the most common environmental factor is incubation temperature. So uh, you have temperature-dependent sex termination in all crocodilians and a whole bunch of turtles. A few lizards as well do that. Um, so there are incubation temperatures that'll make males, some that'll make females, some that'll make some mixture of, of the two sexes. Um, and if you ever wanna do a deep dive on really weird sex termination, there are other environmental triggers that can act as sex determining uh, uh, triggers in some other things. So again, look into Daphnia, look into uh, Borrelia sea worms. There's some really weird stuff out there as to what can actually trigger sex termination. Um, so that's environmental sex termination. The other kind is uh, genetic or genotypic sex termination. So here the chromosome complemented fertilization determines sex. And there's kind of two flavors of this. There's male heterogamy, which is the familiar XXXY sex chromosome system that we see in mammals and Drosophila. Um, and then female heterogamy, uh, the ZZZW system. So the difference here is that in male heterogamy, the male has the odd sex chromosome, uh, the Y, um, and the females have two Xs. And in female heterogamy, it's the female that has the odd sex chromosome pair, a Z and a W, while uh, males have two Zs. So all of these different sex determining mechanisms and more uh, exist amongst vertebrate species. So this is just a phylogeny of vertebrates and I colored in those little boxes there to indicate the kinds of sex determining systems you find within each of those clades. And it's, I think one of the things you'll notice is that there are transitions deep in evolutionary history amongst these different clades. And then in a handful of these clades, particularly the fish, amphibians and reptiles, you see more recent evolutionary transitions within these clades. And if you're interested in studying how sex chromosomes evolve, it's those groups that have sex chromosome or sex determination transitions within those clades that are really the most interesting. So particularly fish, amphibians, and reptiles. So how do sex chromosomes evolve? So this slide shows the origin and differentiation of sex chromosomes in mammals, uh, despite the adorable lizard that's sitting here. Um, but it's thought that this process is pretty generalizable. Um, not only in things outside of mammals with X, 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 Y sex chromosomes, but also in ZZ, ZW systems as well. 
Um, so again, this process is thought to be pretty universal in how sex chromosomes evolve. Um, and this is considered to be the kind of this canonical model of sex chromosome evolution. So sex chromosomes evolve from autosomes. Um, and this, these X's here just indicate ongoing recombination across the length of those, you know, this ancestral uh, autosome pair here. And the first step in this uh, transformation is the appearance of a gene, either through mutation or translocation, that can determine sex. And through a variety of different factors, you can suppress recombination around that locus. Uh, there might be some sexually antagonistic linked locus that that uh, helps that. It's unclear exactly how, how common that is. Um, but you su suppress recombination between the X and the Y at that point. And, um, and over time, that lack of recombination uh, can lead to um, degeneration. So loss of functional genes, accumulation of repetitive elements, et cetera. And so as we kind of follow this over evolutionary time, you go from, uh, you know, two identical autosomes to things that have some slight differences between the X and the Y to increasingly more drastic differences. And you can actually even lose uh, or, or gain large chunks of the, the Y in this case um, and actually have what are called heteromorphic sex chromosomes. And these are a chromosomal pair that when you look at them under a light microscope, making a karyotype, you can actually distinguish them from each other. So the X and Y are actually physically different. Um, and again, those are called heteromorphic sex chromosomes. It's important to, to note though, that these are also sex chromosomes and there are probably lots of differences at the sequence level between the X and the Y. Um, but if you look at them under a light microscope, you can't tell the difference between them, okay? And historically, these have been called homomorphic sex chromosomes. Um, and this is important. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about those homomorphic sex chromosomes in a second, but that's the difference is whether you can distinguish them under a light microscope through traditional karyotyping. So the thing to take away from this is that the Y is a degenerated X, okay? Um, and again, this is thought to be pretty universal. The W is a degenerated Z, right? If you're looking at a ZW system. So if you wanna study the evolution of sex chromosomes, there's a couple things you need to know. You need to know if a species has an XY or a ZW system, that seems pretty basic. Um, and you need to identify which chromosomes in the genome are the sex chromosomes. And these, for a long time, were really challenging questions actually to address. Um, so the reason these were hard to address is that homomorphic sex chromosomes, these sex chromosomes that are, you can't identify by a traditional site of genetics, are actually really common in vertebrates. Um, these are just numbers from the literature in these different groups as the, the proportion of species that have been karyotyped that lack heteromorphic sex chromosomes, okay? And what is both interesting and problematic is that these also coincide with the clades that have the most transitions, right? Um, and in the days when traditional cited genetics was how you identified sex chromosomes, these groups that we knew were interesting were also the ones we couldn't get data from because again, using traditional light microscopy, you actually can't really identify homomorphic sex chromosomes, right? So we knew there were lots of transitions from what little data existed, um, but traditional cytogenic methods were unable to identify those. So um, I don't think it's any surprise nowadays how we solve this. It was through cheap, uh, high quality sequencing. Um, so, the strategy we uh, developed um, for identifying sex chromosomes was to identify first sex, sex specific genetic markers and use that as a proxy. Um, this talk gets more and more adorable as we move on in time because, you know, sequencing is just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper nowadays that, you know, even two or three years ago when I would talk about this, people are like, ooh, and ah, and now it's, it's like, okay, we get it, old timer. <laughs> Um, 
But what we did was um, at the time we would use RADSeq, which is restriction site associated DNA sequencing to identify tens of thousands of genetic loci across the genome. We would uh, generate RADSeq data for multiple males and multiple females. And we developed um, a computer program that would just look for markers that were in one sex and not in the other. Um, a very brute force uh, approach to that. And so, um, if you find something that exists in males and not females, that has to exist on a male-specific portion of the genome, like a Y chromosome. And so male-specific markers would indicate an XY system. And similarly, if you found female-specific markers, those would have to be on a female-specific part of the genome, like a W chromosome, and that would indicate that your species has a ZZZW system, okay? So the really cool thing about using the RADSeq data is that you actually don't need a reference genome to analyze the, these data. We can identify loci and alleles kind of independent of a reference genome. And considering that most reptiles at least don't have genomes uh, for them sequenced, um, this made it a really convenient way for us to kind of churn through a whole bunch of species really quickly and identify XY versus EW. Um, so this is a phylogeny of lizards and snakes. And I've just indicated some of the different groups that we've identified sex chromosomes in using this RADSeq method. Um, and a lot of these um, lack heteromorphic sex chromosomes. Um, so the things that traditional cytogenetics couldn't get to are now actually really easy to identify using this RADSeq. Okay, so that was the first problem. XY versus ZW, RADSeq, and, and now a whole host of uh, associated methods can, can sort this out. So the next question is which chromosomes in the genome are the sex chromosomes? So remember, sex chromosomes evolve from autosomes. So I'm giving you kind of the genomes of three different hypothetical species here. And two of them have ZW, one of them has an XY. But what you'll notice is that and I colored in which chromosomes are the sex chromosomes here, you can see that each of them are using a different chromosomal pair as the sex chromosomes in this case, right? So the RADSeq is really good at saying XY versus ZW. And that's kind of, in, in the absence of a reference genome, that's kind of where it stops, right? And so we really wouldn't be able to distinguish the sex chromosome systems of these two species if RADSeq is the only tool we have available to us, right? We can say, yeah, they both have ZW, but we don't know if they're the same ZW or a different ZW, right? So we can distinguish that the XY species has a different thing, but, but that's it. So, so there's still more information we need to have here. So the solution is simple. It's just wheelbarrows for money, although it becomes a lot easier. It's like pockets full of money nowadays. Um, so there's a handful of tools that we use to identify sex chromosomes. So the first is if we have a reference genome of our target species or a closely related target species, we can simply take those sex specific RADSeq markers and blast them to that assembly. And they will go to where the non-recombining region of the sex chromosomes is. So that's a really easy thing, right? Another thing is that we can compare male and female read depth again, across whole genomes. So if you have a reference uh, genome, you sequence a male and a female, uh, you map those reads to your assembly. And in the autosomes, male and female read depths should be approximately the same, right? Because they, in a diploid species, they both have two copies. Um, but if you look at the X chromosome here, so in orange, you have female read depth, and in blue, you have male read depth. So you can see right here, male and female read depth is about the same. So this is probably that pseudo-autosomal region that's still recombining that sex chromosomes maintain. And then male read depth drops in half. So what's happening here is, this is on the X, the Y reads are so divergent that they don't map to the X. And so read depth in the male drops to half, but females, because they have two Xs, keep the same read depth as the autosomes do, right? So simply looking at these differences in read depth between males and females can very easily tell you where the sex chromosomes are. Okay. And then the third thing is uh, that you can compare male and female genetic variation using FST or PI or something like that 
uh, using a variety of different data types. It can be the RAD-seq data again, it can be pool seq, RNA seq, whole genomes, all sorts of different data can give you these sorts of um, uh, population genetic statistics. And you just compare males and females as if they're different populations and you look for where there are significant differences, right? I'm gonna show you some examples of that uh, in just a minute. But so these are the, the three strategies you can use. Um, they all depend on a reference genome of that species or a closely related species that you can map things to. Right? So it's not quite as uh, uh, easy to deploy to kind of weird parts of the phylogeny where you don't have a lot of reference genomes. And so the types, again, just to kind of highlight the types of transitions you can identify now with this. So in this example, again, here you have a little cartoon uh, genome. You have an XY system on this chromosome. It evolves in the most recent common ancestor to all these descendants. They all have the same thing. Okay, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the boring example because there's really no transitions. So here you have a transition here on the tree to a ZW system. You also have a change in which chromosomes are the sex chromosomes. This you could have identified just using the RADSeq, but you get a, a bunch of really cool information by knowing that there's also this transition to a different chromosome, right? Um, but the RADSeq alone could have told you that at a minimum there was a transition here. It's this scenario here that having reference genomes of your target species or a closely related species really makes a difference because you have an XY to another XY transition, um, but you can only identify that if you know which chromosomes are the sex chromosomes. Okay. Any questions about any of this so far? All right, keep going. Do you get more complicated situations where it's just a you know mixture of both of them and you can't resolve whether it's X, X, Y, or that that scenario is yeah, you can typically tell XY versus ZW. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples where things do get more complicated though. Yeah. Like biology can be a hot mess sometimes. So all right. So um, in that earlier tree, uh, we mentioned that fish, amphibians, and reptiles are, are at least amongst vertebrates, some of the best models you can use because they have lots of transitions. Here's our phylogeny of lizards and snakes again. And I've just colored in the tips to indicate the kinds of sex uh, determining systems you find within each of those groups. Within lizards and snakes, there are three different blades that seem to have a lot of transitions, like, so this is at the family level, even within families, you're seeing transitions. So the first is this clade right here. This is the geckos. We're gonna talk about them in just a minute. Second group is this clade here. These are called acrodonts, but that's chameleons and agamas. This includes things like bearded dragon lizards and things like that. And I think chameleons are something folks are familiar with. And then the third group is this group here. Uh, the boas and pythons. And so I'm going to also give you a, a brief example with boas and, or with pythons at least um, and talk about that. But, but again, even within a, a group that has lots of transitions, there are subgroups that have like a lot of transitions. And so again, this is at the family level. Even within a single genus, you can have transitions. So most of this is work um, that we've done or uh, uh, other folks have done that have identified sex chromosome transitions within a single genus. So these are closely related species. So an XY to XY transition in these geckos, an XY to ZW transition in these guys, uh, XY to ZW here, and XY to ZW here. Um, so again, even among really closely related species, we're finding transitions. Um, and I'm going to tell you uh, story um, about an XY to XY transition uh, in these leaf litter geckos. So this is work from a former PhD student in the lab. He's now uh, a postdoc with Melissa Wilson down at Arizona State. Um, I think the, you guys read this, this was the paper. Okay, so we're gonna touch on that a little bit um, and then talk about it a lot more uh, after the seminar, if you all want to. 
Um, but this is this was Brendan's dissertation work, and he did a really nice job with it. So this is looking at a few members of the genus Ferrodactylus. These are commonly called leaf litter geckos. There's 109 described species. That shows their distribution throughout the Caribbean, Central America, and Northern South America. And they're small, like they're really small. Like if you just Google image search Ferrodactylus, I'm gonna guess that probably a third of those photos are gonna involve a coin of some sort, right? Like people really like photographing them on coins to show you how small they really are. This is Ferrodactylus ariasi. This is the smallest terrestrial amniote. Um, they're from a little island off the Southern coast of Hispaniola. Um, and that's an adult on a US dime, okay? So they're really small. Uh, ecologically, they are essentially insects, right? They're just going through the leaf litter, doing their thing. Um, they're really cool. Uh, this is the family that they belong to, the Sferodactylidae. We don't know a lot about sex chromosome evolution in the Sferodactylidae. We know that genus up there has ZW sex chromosomes. That's from work in our lab. Uh, there's a species in Europe that has XY. One species out of like maybe 60, uh, has an XY here, and two species out of that 109 that have XY sex chromosomes there from a paper that I did a few years ago. Um, and this is that paper. Here are the two species that uh, uh, we talked about, but all the other species we don't know anything about, right? And so this paper used just rad seq data to identify XY versus EW, kind of across a bunch of geckos and identify that like, oh, there's a bunch of transitions here. And that's all we can really say because we didn't have any genomes. So we don't know, are these the same XY? Are they different XYs? So that was one of the questions that, that Brendan was interested in. Um, so his objectives here were to sequence the, the genome from Sferodactylus townsdai to identify its sex chromosomes. It was not one of those two species that, that I looked at in the previous paper use that reference genome to identify the sex chromosomes in a handful of related species, and then kind of ask this question, do all the sampled uh, spheridactylus share the same sex chromosomes, okay? So these are the species we looked at. Um, these five species are from Puerto Rico or islands in the Puerto Rican bank. Um, spheridactylus notatus is from the Bahamas, that's our outgroup. Um, and Sferodactylus towns and die is the one whose genome we sequenced, okay? These are the two species that I did in that 2015 paper where we'd had rad seq data and could say, yep, they have XY sex chromosomes, but that, that's it, okay? So these are the, the players we're gonna be talking about here. Um, we didn't have a lot of money for this project, so we were able to make the reference genome. We did resequencing from a few individuals of just like, whole genome shotgun aluminum resequencing. We did rad seq, we did a little bit of RNA seq. I'm going to tell you just right off the bat the species Sferodactylus macrolapis. We did not, we were not able to identify their sex chromosomes. So this gets to kind of that there are still mysteries out there. Um, and some some sex chromosomes are hard. What we did identify though with our little bit of data is that they don't have the same sex chromosomes as any of these other species. We we at least know that. Okay, so there's a transition there, but we, we don't know what to. So it's not all I'm gonna say about that one, but you're gonna see it in the trees nonetheless. Okay, I wanna dig a little deeper into this. Um, so what are our expectations when we're mapping reads to the reference genome at kind of different stages along this evolution? So, When you have really uh, divergent X and Y sex chromosomes, at this, you know, so they're really divergent at the sequence level, they may or may not be heteromorphic or homomorphic, but the X and Y themselves at the sequence level are really divergent. Um, in that case, the Y reads won't map to the X, okay? They're just too different. So you map your reads, and that's where you get half male read depth on the X, right? Because the Y reads aren't mapping. Um, but interestingly, if you, if you think about this, um, you will have really no differences between male and female FST in that scenario because you just have Xs being represented, right? 
So when you compare male and female FST, there's really, it's, it's gonna be low. And male pi is gonna be really low. And again, this is because you're looking at just the hemizygous X, right? You don't have any Y reads in the equation because they just don't map to your X, okay? So, so those are kind of these expectations when you have older, more divergent sex chromosomes. When you're in this kind of middle range, when you have kind of more newly evolved, younger sex chromosomes, or at least sex chromosomes that aren't very diverged from each other, your X and Y are similar enough that the Y reads will still map to that X scaffold, right? So in this case, your male and female read depths won't really vary because the, the Y reads are still mapping, right? They're similar enough that at least they map. Um, but they're still different. And this is where male versus female FST is gonna be really high. And male pi is gonna be really high because you've got both the X and these really divergent Y reads um, all mapping there, okay? So these are kind of the expectations you expect to see at these different stages along this evolutionary continuum of sex chromosome degeneration. Does everybody have a handle on that? So I'm gonna show you some images and plots and just kind of just remember when male, re, male and female read depth is the same, but FST and pi are really high, you have younger sex chromosomes, presumably where your Y reads are mapping and where you have half male read depth and but lower FST and pi, um, male pi, those are older, more degenerated sex chromosomes. It all has to do with whether your, your Y reads are mapping or not. Do you have any Y specific you know, context or anything to map against? Yes and no. So in some cases, so in this case, for instance, the non-recombining region is so small that we, we don't and our, we know that our assembly is chimeric, okay? Um, with the advent of PacBio Hi-Fi and these long, accurate reads with the ability to phase things, um, either using high C or, or trios, we are now able to create phased diploid genomes where we have an X and Y contig. Yeah, that, moving forward, we're in a much better scenario. Although there's a whole host of issues as to how you actually map reads in that scenario, <laughs> but that, that's a different thing. Okay. So the other thing I wanna point out here is that these uh, six species that we're looking at they're the ones in bold here. Uh, and then Notatus is like outside of this even, um, are just a snapshot of a much more diverse group of lizards. And there is likely a lot more going on here than I'm gonna present. Okay, so the first thing I wanna point out is, so this is Ferdacles Townsend eye. We're looking at uh, male versus female FST, read depth, and male versus female pi. I'm going to zoom in in just a second, so, so don't worry too much. Um, so so Townsend I does have an XY sex chromosome system there with the obligatory coin. We were able to design PCR primers on the Y chromosome that, you know, amplify in males and not in females, so we can validate that. This is a good sanity check. Um, there was someone in the lab next door to us where I did my postdoc, and I was. She would come to our, our lab meetings, and I would show all these bioinformatics results, and she's like, "I only believe gels." She was like this old school molecular biologist, and so I'm like, "Okay," and I started doing this. And I can tell you, reviewers love it because it's hard to argue against a gel, really. I mean, she was spot on, right? <laughs> so, um, so I carried on with this. Whenever we can, we try to just like let's design some PCR primers and like the, argue with that with a, a reviewer. Like that's a fool's errand, right? Like no reviewer is going to go up against that. So anyway, um, I'm going to zoom in. There seems to be some interesting stuff going on down over here, right? So let's zoom in on that. Okay. So I'm zooming in on that end. So the first thing we did so we had rat seek data from here. We took the male specific markers and we blasted into the genome. Every one of these little orange lines is a male specific 
rad seek marker. They map at a very high density right here. Okay, so first off, just right off the bat, this is the region where the male specific rad markers are going to. You can see that in all of these. So that's male versus female FST way up at the top. You can see that it gets really high in that same region. This is read depth. You can see that it doesn't really change in that re region. And then in black is male pi, and in gray is female pi. It jumps around a lot, but you can see that female pi stays low, male pi jumps up. Okay. This is all consistent with that early stages of sex chromosome differentiation that I talked about earlier. Okay. All very consistent with that. So I think we found it. Um, this is chromosome three in the assembly. And um, so now this is looking at um, um, male versus female FST and pi. So FST at the top and pi underneath that with the rad markers um, in orange. And we're looking at it now at a bunch of our different species. So this is um, Nichols eye. This is the closest relative that we sampled to the Townsend eye where we had the reference genome. Um, this is uh, cloud eye. We didn't have rad seek data, but we have uh, uh, pi there. This is Nigo eye. There's something going on here, but it's a very different pattern than what we see up there, right? Um, this is Macrolapis. This is the one where, like, we're not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, and then this is Notatus, our outgroup. And they're doesn't really seem to be anything happening there. So to think about this phylogenetically, so the three species we sampled in this plate pretty clearly have the same sex chromosome system as each other um, on chromosome three. Don't know what's happening here. It's certainly not chromosome three, notatus are out group. And this one, chromosome three seems to be involved. There was, Like um, male pi was really high. Our rad seek markers are mark are mapping there, not here. And male versus female FST is pretty high right there. But it's a much bigger region than what we're seeing in those other three species. Um, so then we went and we looked at the whole genome. So this is just FST across the whole genome. It's important to point out that the further out on the tree you get, um, remapping and calling SNPs can get a little noisier, okay? So this is our outgroup, and you can see it's pretty noisy. Um, I'll show you some data that hopefully clarifies a bit of this, but for these more closely related things, it seems to be pretty clean. Okay, so here we have times nine nickels eye. You can see that spike on chromosome three. So this is chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, et cetera, in the alternating gray and, and black circles. Um, I want to look at the Nido eye here. So this is the one that had a really large region, of chromosome three, behaving like a sex chromosome. It also seems to have a really large region of chromosome one, behaving like a sex chromosome. Um, and so, so again, there's chromosome three. And there's chromosome one. If we zoom in just on chromosome one in these species, um, what you'll see is, do I have a, okay, zoom in on that. Yeah. So this is just chromosome one. So we have more male specific rad markers in this species. This is an EUI. And it seems like a pretty big region is a sex chromosome there. So we actually think there's a, a Y autosome fusion here. And we have an, an XX, XX slash XXY system <laughs> going on here. So there's a Y autosome fusion. So we have a, a, a part portion of the Neo Y, and then we have a Neo X that's involved. And that's why there's two different chromosomes going on here. Um, what's really kind of cool though, so when we zoom in on our out group, we did rad seek for them. They didn't have very many male specific markers, but they all map right there. And you see a spike of uh, male versus female FST in that same spot. And what's really interesting is that this spot 
doesn't seem to overlap with anything that's looking like a sex chromosome in that species. So as you kind of bring this all together, okay, so here's the species that we sequence the genome for. So this clade is doing that really small region of chromosome three is a sex chromosome, okay? And no question there. This species has a really large chunk of chromosome three and chromosome one in what appears to be some sort of Y-autosome fusion multi-sex chromosome system. Um, and then the outgroup is using chromosome one, but it's a really small region and it's not overlapping with the part of chromosome one that this species is using, okay? So we can pretty clearly say that chromosome three became a sex chromosome along this branch, right? And all of these critters are, have it because it evolved in a common ancestor. Maybe chromosome three was the ancestral sex chromosome here and just kind of really expanded when you got into this lineage. Um, but remember, we do know that chromosomes one or three are not involved in the species sex chromosomes. So there's either a turnover away from that or chromosome three got recruited independently. Um, so we kind of just like left it at that and published the paper and we're like, we're gonna need to like do more species sampling, do more genome sequencing. There's a lot more to be said about this system. And, and where we're at now, just even with, with incomplete sampling amongst these species, like sampling a handful of more taxa could really tell us a lot more confidently about what's happening here. But even just glancing at a few species like this, we found some crazy stuff and a large number of transitions with, you know, again, a chapter of a, a single PhD dissertation. So um, I think what this highlights is just how bonkers lizards and snakes can be. Um, and when you look anywhere, you can find weird stuff like this. Okay, want to move on to the second story, which is a system that we thought we actually knew quite a bit about, um, but it turns out we don't. Um, and that's snake sex chromosomes. So remember how um, remember how I said that this canonical model of sex chromosome evolution that you know we know is happening in mammals. We think that it works pretty universally. So one of the uh, um, one of the first couple models that folks kind of expanded this into to show its universality was examples in birds and in snakes. So they both have Z, Z, Z W systems, um, and uh, it was by examining their sex chromosome evolution that. Um, Scientists were like, you know what? We think this process is probably universal to just how sex chromosomes evolve. And the person that really championed this and did some of the, the groundbreaking work was Susumo Ono. And uh, some of this is work in his uh, book, Sex Chromosomes and Sex-Linked Genes, and a handful of papers that are associated with that. So, um, so this came out in 1967. Um, and again, one of the big ideas from this was yeah, the, the weird thing that's happening in mammal sex chromosomes is probably universal. And here's some examples in birds and snakes that show that. Um, the other thing this book did is it took the idea of dosage compensation that Mary Lyon had, again, discovered uh, and said that probably has got to be universal too. Like if the process by which sex chromosomes degenerate is universal, the solutions to the problems of of you know, haploinsufficiency and everything else that dosage compensation solves are also probably going to be universal. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a really cool book. And if you're interested in sex chromosomes and, and like a historical take on things, I cannot recommend it enough. So the example that Ono uses, so this is a, a about this, but this is a figure from this Recheck et al. paper. Ono's a, a co-author on this. Um, these were some cited geneticists in Brazil that were working on snake sex chromosomes that Ono um, was working a lot with. Um, and the idea here is you have a primitive snake, in this case a boa, and then advanced snakes, 
uh, in this case, a, a colubrid and a viper. And Ona said, like, this totally fits this model of going from a primitive homomorphic state to the advanced degenerated heteromorphic state, right? So Ona's like, okay, this fourth chromosomal pair are the sex chromosomes you can see in the primitive snake. They're homomorphic. They get increasingly heteromorphic the more advanced you get, okay? This clade, which actually consists of most snake species, are called canophidian snakes. I may slip up and say that. Um, so I don't like the term advanced snakes and primitive snakes. So if I just call these canophidian snakes, you know, I'm talking about these critters here. So I'm going to publish this in paper, the book, the very widely read, very influential book. Um, and folks went with it. Some very high profile, really good papers found this pattern. Um, this is from Kazumi Matsubara's PNAS paper in 2006, essentially replicating the experiment that Bichek et al. had done, but now using really advanced cytogenetic methods. So here they have a python, a rat snake, and a, and a viper. And what they did is they did a uh, comparative fish, so fluorescence and hybridization with particular loci on the Z. And they looked whether they saw signal on both the Z and the W or on just the Z. And these are the different loci they had fish probes for and whether they, they could observe them on the Z and the W. And in the Python, all of their Z linked loci were also observed on the W. In the colubrid snake, a few of the z link loci were found on the W, and only one of them in the, in the viper. And they say in the paper, this is entirely consistent with, with Ono's hypothesis. Look, snakes follow this model, and this is probably the canonical model of sex chromosome evolution is probably how it happens. We get into the sequencing era. So this is a, a, just truly a, a really amazing paper out of Doris Patrog's group. Um, and they did male versus female read depth um, across the macro chromosomes. And this is the snake sex chromosome here. You can see in a boa, male and female read depth is the same. Uh, and then you have half female read depth in a garter snake and half female read depth in a rattlesnake. Okay. Again, it was right. We're going to take a little pause here, okay? A little detour. We'll get us back to this. I want to talk about facultative parthenogenesis in vertebrates. Who here know, knows what parthenogenesis is? What's, what's parthenogenesis? Uh, being able to produce uh, only through female. Yeah, yeah. And, and so this, everybody can hear that? Yeah, this female only reproduction. Um, so in vertebrates, at least, they're are quite a few species that have obligate parthenogenesis. So it's it's an all-female species, females clone themselves, and, and you only find females of that species. There's this other phenomenon called facultative parthenogenesis. So this is where otherwise sexually reproducing species will just have females that are just like, oops, babies, right? Um, this is usually discovered in zoos and aquariums where the animals are kept in isolation and people can actually say like, hey, this anaconda has been all by herself for 20 years and we go into the cage and one day there's a bunch of babies, right? Like that's typically how folks identify it. Although interestingly, using genetic tools, folks have actually gone out into at least wild rattlesnake populations and have identified this occurring in the wild as well. So it's not just an artifact of captivity. Um, so uh, Warren Booth and Gordy Shewitt published a review paper of this in 2016, kind of looking at the phylogenetic distribution and some of the patterns that they'd see. So most of these papers don't show up in high profile journals. It's just like some note of like, okay, so some organism had this virgin birth and, and we're reporting that note. And so this was a really important paper because it took all these little kind of anecdotes and brought them together and tried to synthesize and make sense of it all. One of the patterns they've noticed 
is that species with ZW sex chromosomes only produce male offspring and species with XY sex chromosomes only produce female offspring. Okay, so that was a pattern that they noticed. And then they noticed an exception to that pattern. And that exception to that pattern was boas and pythons. So here is a phylogeny of uh, snakes. And then they've just highlighted um, whether you have male versus female offspring as a result of facultative parthenogenesis. And you can see that those couple in red have female offspring and the ones in blue have male offspring. And in this paper, they're like, you know, they describe some like really weird meiotic stuff that could maybe <laughs> explain this. Like if, if chromosomes were pretzels, right? Like imagine the weirdest meiosis ever. Like, and they're like, well, maybe. But then they're like, there may be a more parsimonious solution to this. And that is maybe bows and pythons don't have ZZZW system. So Warren Booth got in touch with me and we had just published our first big rad seek paper. And he said, hey, would this rad seek thing work in snakes? And I'm like, you bet it would. And he's like, well, let's do bows and pythons and see what they have. Because he's like, I've got this crazy idea. So we looked at Burmese pythons and boa constrictors. Uh, our rad seek identified male specific markers. Uh, Here's the gel for all the haters. Um, <laughs> and uh, so when you see the faint bands were oh, so so this this is interesting. The pythons we did not have a lot of rad seek markers for it. Like it appears they have a very small newly evolved sex chromosome system. One of our markers, the only way we could actually like prove it out on gel was to do because the only difference between the male and female or the the X and the Y allele was at the restriction site. So we do PCR and then we restrict and digest it. And so here are the, this is the X allele undigested. And then the Y allele breaks into two fragments that are different sizes. So yeah, I had to like go back and I had to like talk to old professors like restriction digesting PCR products. Is this a, is this a thing? And they like do all about it. Um, yeah. So. There's a rad seek. The other thing with the little ghost bands, is remember the, the Y is a degenerated X. And so your primers may be designed for that Y allele. There's probably still some sequence similarity, especially in the absence of like primo template, right? So gotten really good at explaining all this to reviewers. <laughs> so XY sex chromosomes in bow and python. We actually had drafts genomes for boa python as, as well as rattlesnake. And so we can map these markers and identify the broader chromosomes. And what's really kind of crazy is that the python sex chromosomes are actually the same linkage group as the canophidian snake CW. So their XY is actually it's the same chromosome as the canophidian CW. Boa was on a completely different chromosome. But that's interesting for a few reasons. One is that that one chromosome seems to become sex chromosomes two different times in snakes, and that bow and python have different XYs. So um, thinking about this, so, so Ono wasn't wrong in that the canonical model of sex chromosome evolution is probably how most sex chromosomes evolve, right? So I don't want you to get that impression. Um, but the thing is, if, if, if you think about This image, how did they know those were the sex chromosomes when they're homomorphic? By definition, homomorphic sex chromosomes can't be identified by, say, genetics. We went back to the literature and a, a ton of snake karyotypes, and no boas and pythons have distinguishable sex chromosomes. We found an exception in a weird paper about a species we didn't sample. There's another turnover. <laughs> but none of the bows and pythons that, that Ono looked at have distinguishable sex chromosomes. So I think he assumed that was their sex chromosomes. He didn't actually really know.
Okay, so just to summarize this bit, bows and pythons don't have a ZZZW sex chromosome system. Facultative parthenogenesis pattern suggests an XY system. RADC confirms that. Genomes indicate that bows and pythons have different XY sex chromosomes. And the Python XY is the same chromosomes as the Catophidian ZW. That's pretty cool. Um, so that paper came out in 2017. It's been rattling around in our brain. Like, we're really interested in this Python XY because it's the same sex chromosome as the Canophidian ZW. We wanted to dig into that. So to do that, we sequenced the genome of a ball python. So this is closely related to the Burmese python that we use. These are really common in the pet trade. And we took our male specific RADSEQ markers and we mapped them through the genome. And this was a really good genome. The, the Burmese python genome we had at the time was super fragmented. We really couldn't say a lot about it. But with our new chromosome level assembly, we show a really tiny region um, on what we're now calling the X as to where these things map. This is just um, male versus female pi. So male pi is in black. You see that increase. Female pi stays about the same. These are male specific rad markers right here. Um, so this is a region that's less than about uh, um, uh, 20 megabases. Um, then we annotated this genome and we kind of zoomed in. So again, these are our male specific RAD markers. And these three genes right here, this one is complete. These two are just fragments. The gene that is complete is a gene called DMRT1. And there is both an X and a Y copy, um, as well as an OG autosomal copy that still exists, I think it's on chromosome two. So there's a duplication, translocation to another chromosome. Um, the other two genes that are here um, are fragments of the neighbors of DMRT1 on the autosome. And they just seem to be like popped out and moved. Um, and again, there's a copy on both the X and the Y. So little sidebar on DMRT1. Um, this is a transcription factor. Uh, the DM domain gene family is involved in sexual development in all animals. For those of you that study C. elegans, which I know is a big thing around here, MAB3 is a DM domain gene. For those of you fly people or insect people, double sex is a DM domain gene. Um, and if you study vertebrates, it's DMRT1. Uh, it's crucial for the differentiation and maintenance of the vertebrate testis. Uh, DMRT1 or a paralog is the primary sex determining gene in birds, in Xenopus, and in at least three fish species that we know of, including Medaka and the Siamese fighting fish. Um, and even cooler is that some work in the red-eared slider, which has temperature-dependent sex determination, it is likely temperature-dependent methylation of DMRT1 promoter that translates the temperature signal into the sex determining pathways. DMRT1, super important in sex determination. And it's just like sitting there <laughs> in this non-recombining region, in this duplication. So we made PCR primers of the Y copy of DMRT1 and show that for every member of the genus Python amplifies in a sex specific manner. We then went ahead and did some resequencing from a variety of different pythons. And we just built a phylogeny of DMRT1 from some snakes. We've got a few lizard outgroups there. Um, and then the various alleles that we found. And so in gray is the autosomal copy. This is our X copy in a, diff a bunch of different Python species. And this is the Y copy in a bunch of different Python species. These two Python species did not have different X and Y alleles. And they showed up in kind of this weird spot on the tree. And the first thing we noticed is we looked on an exon by exon basis and they kind of have like one of the exons looks like it would be the Y copy, other exons look like it's the X copy. And it appears there's ongoing recombination at that locus that have taken an ancestral X and Y system. And now it's not behaving like a sex chromosome anymore. Recombination is, is starting back up again. And so we looked at read depth 
uh, for these guys, and we are still in the process of doing this, but this is the genus Morelia. These are carpet pythons and green tree pythons. And on chromosome eight is this region where male to female reed depth pops up. So this can be consistent either with half the reed depth in the female, the ZW system, or be consistent with some sort of duplication in males, maybe a tandem duplication on a Y or something like that. So we're, we're, we're still working this out as to exactly what's going on here but you have a turnover here to a new system. It's likely on chromosome eight. And at a minimum, the ancestral X and Y are recombining and behaving like autosomes. So what we think is happening here is you have this gene duplication from the autosome to, to there. We have an inversion on the Y that's, that's locked in uh, recombination restriction. And it appears that on the phylogeny, so here are Canopidian snakes, here are some various different boas things, and this clade are pythons. It appears that, that DMRT1 duplication appears here in the most recent common ancestor to pythons. And then you have a, a turnover away from that ancestral system in this genus. We're still figuring out what it went to, but, but that's ongoing. But they still have remnants of the ancestral DMRT1 duplication. And they're actively recombining now like they would if they're an autosome. So that's pretty cool. Um, so again, this is ongoing um, and, uh, and we hope to have this wrapped up in the next year or so uh, once we kind of nail exactly what's going on with um, Morelia. So when you walk out of here, if there's anything you remember, I hope you remember that lizard and snakes are really ideal models to study sex chromosome evolution. We now have tools that allow us to study this in diverse species, including those with homomorphic sex chromosomes that prior to like 10 years ago, we just couldn't even begin to, to look into. And investigating sex chromosomes in diverse taxa can fill gaps in our knowledge about the generalities of how sex chromosomes evolve. So I want to thank folks currently in the lab, formerly in the lab, collaborators, funders, institutions. Um, I am recruiting a PhD student for next year. We've got uh, Marquette in Milwaukee. Uh, we've got three NSF or two NSF grants and an NIH grant. So we're, we've got stuff on the sex chromosome evolution of lizards and snakes. We have a big grant, collaborative grant looking at sex differences in aging. And we have a NIH grant to implement CRISPR gene editing in geckos. So we can now take these putative sex determining genes and actually do functional experiments. Um, so shoot me an email. I know there's undergrads in the audience. So if you like geckos and genomes, uh, this is the place to go. And then I'll take questions. Correct. Okay. All of the transitions that you've ever seen in our new systems, like the uh, system. Is there anything about the chromosomes where uh, that, that turn into sex chromosomes that's distinct from the other chromosomes in the genome? Is there yeah. anything at all like the size distribution or? Yeah, so this has been an interesting and ongoing debate for a while, right? So early on, when we didn't know a lot of different sex chromosome systems, actually chromosomes that have DMRT1 on them kept popping up, right? They showed up in birds. There's there's actually a gecko that has that linkage group as a sex chromosome. There's a turtle that does. Like, they kept showing up. And so the idea is there may be the gene content of chromosomes might prime them because they have some of these genes that are important in sex determination. Um, the more we look, I've got this figure, it's, it's kind of confusing because I don't include it in my talks as much, but it's it's basically every chromosome in the chicken genome. We're using chicken as a reference. And then I've got a phylogeny on, on the other axis, and I've just colored in which chromosome is the sex chromosome in all these different lizards and snakes and birds. And like we filled in almost all the chromosomes at this point. So now that doesn't mean that some things may be more biased, but it, at the moment, almost everything has been identified as a sex group. And, and I'm sure that within the next few years, we will completely fill in that. 
So, so that's one option. The other option is, so recombination is really key to becoming a sex chromosome. And the recombination landscape is not the same for all chromosomes. So most reptiles, and I'm including birds here, have macro and micro chromosomes. Micro chromosomes are little weirdos. They have uh, really increased recombination rates. They interact with each other in super weird ways in the nucleus. Like if you look at high contact maps, they kind of look like one big chromosome. Like they're doing really weird stuff. And those differences may kind of bias who becomes a sex chromosome versus not. It might be really hard to restrict recombination when you have just a very little region where some recombination needs to happen. What's interesting about geckos is, is that they uh, fused all of their microchromosomes to uh, the larger macrochromosomes. And ancestral gecko karyotype is like this all acrocentric kind of from big to not big. And like, we don't know anything about recombination rates yet, but um, a very different genomic organization than all, most all the other lizards of snakes. So is that one reason why geckos are particularly prone to a lot of this weirdness? I don't know, but like that's a freaking amazing question that is still outstanding. So I'm sure there's lots of questions, but unfortunately we have reached the end of our actual seminar time. So uh, I'm sure Tony would be more than happy uh, if any of you have burning questions to contact him, but I'm gonna have to cut it off here. So please join me in thanking Tony Gamble for his wonderful presentation.